Yes, you've read that correctly. Elias invited Thysot Slab and me to join him reacting 50 kg of iron oxide with 50 kg of aluminium shavings. If you have ever wondered what 100 kg of thermite looks like, now you know. Because it was way cheaper, magnetite was used as the iron oxide source, in case you're wondering why the iron oxide is black and not reddish. Of course, we weren't going to react 100 kg of thermite at once, we mixed 5 batches of 20 kg each. To ignite the relatively coarse thermite mixture, an ignition charge of very fine thermite was used. You can see it being prepared here. To be honest, I didn't expect the large aluminum shavings to be suitable to make thermite, but I was definitely proven wrong by Elias. The first question that comes to mind is where do you place 20 kg of thermite for the reaction? We wanted the liquid iron to drip onto different objects, so we couldn't just put it on the ground and light it on fire. To solve this problem, Elias channeled his inner mason a few days earlier and built two large reaction vessels out of foam concrete. The victim for the first thermite reaction was the obligatory watermelon. I think torturing watermelons is now mandatory for such videos. But first of all, 20 kg of thermite must be mixed. A huge thank you to Elias from Elias Experiments for this awesome opportunity to join him. He and Thysot's lab both released a video of this day, so make sure to check them out. You will also find other great chemistry related videos on both channels. The thermite is then filled into the reaction vessel and the ignition mixture is put into a hollow. Since it would be extremely unhealthy to ignite the thermite by hand, a chemical delay charge was used, consisting of potassium permanganate and glycerin. After the glycerin is poured onto the potassium permanganate, you have about 30 seconds before the mixture ignites. In this powerful reaction, the iron oxide is reduced to elemental iron and aluminum is oxidized to aluminum oxide. This reaction is so exothermic that the iron becomes a liquid. Thermite has various applications, for example to weld railroad tracks. And of course, the military has also found uses for thermite. It is mainly used to destroy enemy and friendly material. A few charges of thermite in the breach of an artillery piece will weld it shut and render the equipment useless. And while we are on the subject of food waste, why not place 10 kg of sugar under the reaction vessel? A lot of burned and foamed sugar was the result. After it cooled down a bit, we could pull a heavy lump of iron out of the sand. And it was even hotter than we thought. <laughs> Some of you may have seen videos of thermite being ignited over a large piece of ice. The result is a violent explosion. But why does it explode? It is often claimed that it is a simple steam explosion, since the hot iron vaporizes the water abruptly. But we wanted to get to the bottom of this. If it is a steam explosion, other frozen substances should also cause this reaction. Our first test was performed with dry ice. Dry ice is solid carbon dioxide, which should also evaporate or more precisely sublimate abruptly due to the strong heat.
And sure, it splashed around a lot more than it would have without the dry ice, but the reaction was not nearly comparable to that of ice. Perhaps an abrupt oxidation of the hot iron with the release of hydrogen explains the violent reaction better. If any one of you got a good explanation, let me know in the comments. To test again if other frozen substances show the same behavior as water, Elias froze 8 liters of cyclohexane. And yes, I can understand your environmental concerns, but believe me, in the end there won't be much left of the cyclohexane than CO2 and water. Before we get to the most spectacular reaction, I wanted to test if I could create a ruby in a thermite reaction. Quite a while ago I saw a video by Wheeler Scientific and some Austrian guy in which they tried just that, unfortunately without much success, although there were some rubies visible. The melting point of ruby is about 2000 degrees celsius, so it should be possible to melt a mixture of alumina and chromium oxide in a thermite reaction. So I dug a hole and filled it with a few kilograms of thermite. In the middle of this pile a small bag with a mixture of alumina and chromium oxide was placed. Unfortunately, even after cooling we could not detect any fluorescence typical of rubies. But the mixture of molten sand, iron and slag was extremely satisfactory. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, everything was again cooled down in our trusty puddle. By the end of the second reaction, the water was comfortably warm. Now, however, the reaction of ice with thermite. We again placed a 10 liter bucket of ice under the reaction vessel and kept our distance. Having seen this reaction myself, I do not believe that it is a simple steam explosion, especially since the hot iron was already in contact with the ice before the explosion happened. And it is not a sealed vessel, which means the steam could easily escape. If you think I'm wrong and have any ideas how to test this theory further, post it in the comments. 
Do you have any ideas for other interesting experiments with thermite? Let me know and we will try to make it happen. If you liked this video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you want to see more videos like this, consider subscribing to my channel and supporting me on Patreon. Thank you a lot for watching.